You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech Podcast. My guest is Alberto Savoya. He's the author of a new book that's coming out called The Right It, and it talks about uh, the failure rate of startups and how to launch ideas successfully and not be one of the uh, the majority of people that fail with them. And we'll get more into details, but I want to welcome you, Alberto. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so um, what what inspired you to write a book about failure and how not to fail. You know, tell me a little bit about your background. So, yeah, my, my background is that uh, I was very fortunate. Uh, the first startup I did was in video games when I was in my uh, late teens. Uh, it was a success. Then I happened to join a, another startup called Sun Microsystems in the very early days, and that was a success. Uh, then I, after I left it, I, I started a VC-funded startup we raised $3 million, and 18 months later, we received an acquisition offer for $100 million. And finally, I was one of the early employees at Google. So, uh, you know, I, I, I had a pretty good run, and I thought that I was uh, invincible. Uh, I thought I was the yep. Italian Steve Jobs, uh, Stefano <laughs> Giobini, <laughs> That's cool. if you will. And uh, then, you know, uh, at Google, I managed the team that uh, launched AdWords, so that, that looked pretty good. And... It was clear that Google was going to be successful, so I had the itch for doing another startup. So I left Google, and this time I raised uh, $25 million over three rounds of funding to do a, uh, my second VC-funded startup. And unfortunately, this one didn't work as well. Even though we had the best VCs in the industry, including Sequoia and NEA, we built a first-class team. We built a product that everybody told us, if you build it, we will buy it. It was a software yeah. development tool, so a bit too technical. Right. But then we built exactly what the people told us they wanted. We launched it, and you know, people just didn't buy. So my, my reaction there was, what happened? We built something sure. right, but we didn't build the right it. And that, uh, so that, that very first, very big painful failure uh, led me down this uh, path where I decided, why did this happen to me? This has happened to other people, and how can I stop uh, stop it from happening? Uh, the way I like to put it in the book is, yeah, failure bit me. I decided to bite back, and the book is one of the ways I bite back. Yeah, it's funny when I was, uh, I, 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 I guess the story kind of makes sense, but when I was like six or seven years old, I got a dog for the first time, and the dog bit me one time, and I decided to bite the dog back. So I, I you know, grabbed its skin and I bit it, and it tasted disgusting, and the dog yelped. But uh, it just the story came to mind, you know, maybe to make you laugh. So. Yeah, well, you know, the, the, the beast of failure is metaphorical, so the bite is metaphorical. <laughs> but the, right, right, let me but tell I you, a real uh, one. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a uh, bite, whether they're real or to your body or to your psyche, they, they hurt. So I decided to bite um, back and I, I decided to study failure. So I was fortunate enough, I, Google took me back, so I went back to Google. And okay. at that time, Google itself was starting to experience its own failures, right? Not, not every product that Google launches is a success. In fact, if you search for Google failures, one of the pages you see is called the Google Graveyard, where they have a list of many of the products that Google failed at. By the way, Microsoft also has its own uh, uh, version called the Microsoft Morgue. The, the point oh, wow. here is that whether you're an entrepreneur or a, a, you know, a multi-billion dollar already very successful company, most new products launched in the market will fail. And I call this the law of market failure. 
not only will they fail, but they will fail even if they're well executed. Uh, so my, my goal was to find out how can these companies, you know, the same company that launched Google Search and Google uh, uh, Gmail have failed with so many other products. And mm. that led me down to the main realization that I, uh, that I put in the book, which is most new products fail because they're not what I call the right it. The right it is a product that if competently executed will succeed in the market. The wrong it well, is a product that no matter how well you build it, design it, market it, is destined to fail in the market. And if you go and look at the, well, the market magic, research, uh, Yeah, the magic is telling the difference early enough so that you don't uh, you know, lose your butt and lose uh, millions of dollars. But what, before we get into this, I, I wanted to ask you just backing up a little bit. So when you said you studied failure, what did that look like? Did you look at hundreds of case studies or you know, how did you study failure? I, I attacked it from all angles. So first of all, you can look at the statistics, right? And the statistics, they haven't changed in a long time. Nielsen Research looks at new product launches every year. They look at tens of thousands of products and then they produce this report and every year the results are the same. About 80% of the products, plus or minus 2%, fail every year. So the statistics are pretty much, uh, you cannot argue against them. They're consistent mm. from year to year. Uh, the, and then I talked to a lot of people and I asked them, hey, you know, Bob, you've, you've been in the three companies, you know, two of them failed. Tell me your story. And uh, uh, people actually don't mind talking about their failures, right? It's like the, sh the scene in Jaws, right? Where uh, the uh, the, the characters like to show their scars from shark bites and uh, other acts. Yeah. You know, in, at yeah. least in Silicon Valley, failure is a badge of honor. So I asked them, why do you think your product failed? And initially they come up with a lot of reasons, but I kept digging in. And uh, in almost all cases, I would say more than 90%, the realization was that, you know, we had a good team, we had enough money, we built it right, we just built the product that the market doesn't care about. Uh, so the, I look at both data and personal interviews and the results intersected in this uh, very clear realization. Most new products fail, not due to poor execution, but because in fact, most of the time people execute well on the wrong idea. So what makes an idea right or wrong or the right it? Like what are some of the critical elements you see? Well, okay, so you know, your product is called your podcast is called Future Tech. So the right. the technique is to kind of, how can you look at the future, right, of, of, of an idea? Uh, are there any ways of doing that? And it turns out that there is. So the the goal is this: you want to make sure that you're building the right it before you build it right. Now, the right it is a product that if you execute it well and you know if you're not outcompeted the product will succeed in the market. But how can you know if the product is right for the market before you actually yeah. build it? So I started to look around for possible uh, solution and I started to run into these techniques that nobody kind of put together. And let me give you an example. At the dawn of the uh, computer age, IBM wanted everybody to have a computer. I'm talking about late 70s. But if you remember, in the 70s, most people didn't know how to type, right? Who knew how to type? Secretaries, programmers, you know, writers. Uh, so they thought, there's no way that computers will become ubiquitous if people have to learn how to type. Uh, so they thought, we need to have speech-to-text recognition in the first computers. You, you cannot expect a CEO to learn to type on a computer, right? Uh, so what they did, they thought, well, we're decades away from having enough computer power and technology to do that. But let's see what the experience would look like. So they did something very clever. They uh, brought in their potential customers into the room. They put them in front of a microphone and a monitor. And they told them, look, we have a, a speech-to-text computer. You just talk to it, and it will do your bidding. Uh, consider it like a professional typist. So people started to speak into it. They would say, computer, dictate a letter. Dear Mr. Jones, so-and-so. And magically, the text appeared on the screen. People thought that it was a computer doing all that work, and they were amazed. In reality, there was a professional typist in another room listening to the microphone uh, output and typing everything by hand. So <laughs> That's funny. because they could not build 
a prototype, they pretended to have a prototype, right? The, to, to see how people would react and whether they would want to buy a device like that. So I thought, this is very clever. This, this is not a prototype because unless you're planning to create a, 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 a race of miniature typists and shove them into a computer box and feed them crackers through the floppy drive, this is not a prototype. You pretended to have one. So I coined the term prototyping uh, or pretendotyping. So pretotyping means two things. Something that you do before you build the actual prototype, but also there is an element of pretending. Let's pretend that we have built it. Let's see if people would buy it. So again, it's uh, before you, you go into the future to build a, your product, try to peek into the future by pretending that you have what you want to build. Instead of prototyping, you're calling it pretotyping. Is that the uh, term you used? That's right. So the, and again, the term pre obviously means something you do before, right? Uh, but also part of it is by pretend. Uh, so the original term I came up with was pretendotyping. Because you're pretending to be in the future. So pretend that this technology or this product exists. Would people really want it? Uh, and so it's, it, it's a technique where you project your idea in the future, you pretend that it exists to see if the market, if and how the market responds to it. Because the biggest problem we have, I mean, the reason why most new products fail in the market is not that people don't do market research. Uh, they do. In fact, sometimes they spend millions on market research. The problem is that they do it in a very hypothetical way. They ask people, if I create this technology, would you actually buy it? So it's, it's, first of all, it's very hypothetical. And second, the people who reply to things like surveys and uh, focus groups don't have any skin in the game. So, you know, whether you succeed that's or fail, gonna, it doesn't make yeah, That's what I was going to ask you. How is this different from a focus group? Like, you know, so you gave that example of the computer, but um, any other examples of how people have prototypes or how they could prototype a project where they either haven't done it or they have? Absolutely. So I've tons. Of, in fact, the book is chock full of examples. That's what I. That's what people want. Give me examples in any category. So I'm. I'm going to throw just a, a few one that people can understand because there are products everybody knows about. It. Uh, let's assume you are okay. McDonald's and. Uh, you think, well, you know, a lot of people don't like to eat meat, so we need some vegetarian offerings. So they decide to come up with an idea, Mac spaghetti. Uh, so as an Italian, the idea offends me, but, you know, who knows? <laughs> it may work. <laughs> so, <laughs> right, so, what I, so there is one way you could do it. You can do it in a focus group and you can go and ask people, hey, would you order spaghetti at the restaurant at uh, McDonald's and then collect the data and launch it? But we know that since most new products fail in the market, 80 to 90%, and most new products do market research, we know that the, the false positive rate is huge. So here's something you could do, a term of prototyping, I call it a, a, a fake door. Just put something on the menu that says Max Spaghetti, and then uh, start to collect data. So let's say I'm the manager of this McDonald's. That's it. I, I would decide. The next 100 people that come in, Say, if they order a burger, whatever they order, I'm going to ask them, would you like to try Max Spaghetti instead? So you run an experiment and uh, you come in, Richard, say, yes, I would like a Big Mac with fries. And I say, uh, would you like to try Max Spaghetti? And you say, yes. Now, here's a problem. This is a prototype. So th nobody has hurt any pasta or overcooked any pasta in the process. You don't have any Max Spaghetti in the back, right? You just yeah, wanted right. to see if people actually wanted it, right? If they want to open pull out their wallets and, and pay. Now, if they say yes, and you don't have the Max Spaghetti, at that point you say, well, actually, I'm sorry, I was doing a market research to make sure that you would want it. You've given me, here's, um, let me give you your lunch for free. So notice how this differs from a focus group. In a focus group, you bring a lot of people and ask them, what would you like to see on the McDonald's menu? Uh, and by the way, when people ask this question in these focus groups, one of the most common answers, we would like to see salad on the McDonald's menu, right? Because people think, I want to eat healthy. Problem is, once you're inside McDonald's and you smell those fries, nobody orders salad. And that's the difference. People can open their mouth and give you their opinion very easily. What you want to do is make sure that they open their wallet. You want to see if they're ready to pay for your idea and put some skin in the game. So this is an example of preto tapping. It's called the fake door. Put it on the menu, see if anybody is ready to order it. And, uh, and then keep count of how many people actually would order it. 
Yeah, I don't. I'm not, I don't mean to be a naysayer or anything. I think it's a good idea. I just know in some industries it they may have a questionable legality if you do it wrong, and then in some industries, obviously, you know, you couldn't do it at all. Like let's say medicine, but I'm sure there's a lot that you could do it in. Any any tweaks to this process that people would have to be aware of before they run out and do something like this? Uh, absolutely. So actually, in the book, I said, you know, make very sure that you follow uh, ethics. Uh, speaking of medicine, uh, pretotyping, uh, uh, my, my book on pretotyping has been featured on the New England Journal of Medicine because medicine, just like any other business, most of the new ideas and treatments and things that you want to do actually do fail. People do not want them. So there are ethical ways of doing uh, pretotyping. But think about it. Think about the McDonald's example. It, think how much you would lose if you decide to launch Max Spaghetti after doing uh, market research the old-fashioned way, and then nobody buys it. Right? So you've, you've cooked and wasted a lot of uh, food. In this scenario, here's what happens. The store gets actual data, not opinion, that people are willing to pay for Max Spaghetti. Because it's not there, you know, it was, uh, you pretend that it was there, you give them a free lunch. So does anybody actually lose? No. The people that went in wanting a burger and they were offered Max Spaghetti to get a free lunch, the store gets real data, not opinions or projections into the future whether they would buy. So nobody loses. And I'll give you another example that everybody knows about these days, and, and that's Tesla, right? So the goal is getting skin in the game. As you may recall, in the early days, when uh, Elon Musk came up with the Tesla Roadster, $120,000, two-seater, all-electric car, uh, you couldn't buy. If you wanted it, you would have to look at one example of it because you had built one by building it on, a, on the chassis of another car and then put down a $5,000 deposit and wait a couple of years before you would get the car, right? So instead of doing market research and asking, would you buy a $120,000 car uh, you know, that needs a charger in the room? And by the way, there, there are no charging stations in most of the states. He probably could, people would have told him, absolutely not. But by doing this, instead of collecting opinion, he collected money. So as you probably know, he collected several hundred checks for $5,000. And to this day, you cannot order a Tesla without putting a deposit. No, make sure that people want it before you actually buy it. Okay, all right. Because I guess it, the premise is it's far easier to execute the right way than to, uh, you know, than to have an idea that'll work or not to evaluate that. So the hardest part is knowing if the market really wants what you want. Once you figure that out, then you could always find a good team and you could, you know, the, the odds of executing properly are so much higher. Is that a fair statement? Uh, absolutely. In, in fact, if you go and look at the market failures, I would say less than 5% are caused by, are due to people that cannot build what they said they were going to build. Now, if you come to me and said, Alberto, I'm going to build a time machine, right? I would say, oh, well, <laughs> maybe you cannot pull it off. But this, I'm talking about things that you know you could build, like, you know, mobile apps, uh, for example, or, or, or software or hardware or opening a, a new restaurant. So execution is rarely the problem. In fact, let me tell you what, if the idea is the right fit, one of the, the sayings that I include in the book is the following. If there's a market, there is a way. When you go and look at the failure rates of startups or new products, what you quickly learn is that uh, people give you a lot of excuses. They can say, well, we run out of money or the, you know, uh, the marketing wasn't very good enough. But here's what actually happens. If people want your product really bad, you know, if there is market demand, they can put up with a lot of imperfections. I mean, look at Twitter in the early days. It kept crashing due mm, to overload. True. Look at the, even the Tesla Roadster, right? Not only do I, you have to pay $120,000 from somebody who's never built a car company before, you need to install a very expensive charger in your garage, and there were no charging stations around it. But people wanted the, you know, the sexy electric car so much that they were willing to put up the money up front. So once well, again, the message has, um, is... Yeah, this has big implications for um, venture capitalists and for angel investors, because from what I know, the way they invest in companies is the exact wrong way, it sounds like. They look at the team, they look at you know all kinds of stuff, but they don't look at uh, whether the product's really been tested. I mean, it's just... Maybe I'm wrong, but it seems like the focus is more on the, the things that are not going to work versus the things that will make it work, according to you. Well, you know, I, actually, you, you have to differentiate. I've, I've been um, on both sides of the VC, you know, doing both due diligence and being an entrepreneur. The mechanics, uh, you know, the, the game that the VCs play is very different, right? 
they, they can put a lot of bets and uh, some of them, in fact, most of them will fail, but the one that succeed will return 10x or if you're lucky, 100x. So their game is very different. They can afford to put a lot of bets and, and take a risk. I, but if but I, should have, uh, I, should, I, I should have asked you a better question. I, I apologize. So what I, I no think worries. a better way to express it is, so if you end up in a VC role again, or for anyone listening that is considering investing in a company, what, has, what have you learned that would change how they would evaluate companies to make it work better for them? Yeah. So if I were a VC role, in, or in fact, if I were on Shark Tank, instead of having people coming to me with a 50-page business plan full of fancy uh, spreadsheets and graphics, which, by the way, I've written several of them myself, I would ask them, can you show me some evidence that people really want the market? Right? So, for example, you know, once again, going back to Tesla and, and Elon Musk, a few hundred checks for $5,000, would you trust those more than a business plan full of projections, Richard? Which one would you rather take as better evidence? Oh, yeah, the checks, definitely. Much, much better evidence. Yep. Ab- a- absolutely. Most business plans, especially five years into the future, are works of fiction, right? As, as a futurist exactly. or somebody interested in the future, you know how difficult it is to predict what actually uh, happens. So if I were ABC, I would make sure that People come to me not with a business plan and projection and results of market research based on dead data. I call it OPD, other people's data, right? And o- OPD sounds like OCD. It's a bad thing, <laughs> right? O- <laughs> OPD means you look at what other people have done and then you base uh, your research, uh, uh, you make your deci- base your decision on that. Now, if Elon Musk had used OPD, he would have never started an electric car company because they all failed before him, right? GM, Toyota, uh, Honda, they all had tremendous trouble. Instead, he collected what I call Yoda, your own data. He said, forget all the other cars. If I build this sexy sports car that goes zero to six in three seconds and it costs $120,000, would you buy it? And then he didn't take the yes or no. If people said yes, he said, okay, just to make sure you're serious about it, can you write me a check for $5,000? So that's what I call Yoda, your own data about your idea with Skin in the game, five thousand dollars worth of skin in the game. So if I were a VC or on okay. Shark Tank, instead of all these projections, I would say, show me that somebody wants your product and pre-totyping, coming up with a pre-totype, a way to get people to open their wallet instead of just their mouth, is the strongest sign of market interest. Okay, well, very good. Um, maybe one one more example, maybe one that's not in the book. You know, I'm sure you probably had overabundance of them. Well, let me another think example of pre-totyping. Uh, well, I can give you some examples on, uh, of known prototyping, and uh, because we've talked yeah. about the, the ones where it succeeds. Let's talk about people who, who decide to ignore this, and they go and they spend millions, hundreds of millions, to build things that they don't succeed. So I'll give you two, a, an oldie but goodie, uh, web van. Right? So web van, on paper, sounded fantastic. By the way, those of you who are too young or you don't remember, web van at the beginning of the internet had the vision of... Uh, internet-based uh, grocery shopping and delivery. You probably remember that one, Richard, right? Yeah, I remember that, and pets.com and all of them, yeah. Yep. That's right. So WebVan raised almost a billion dollars, over $800 million, and on paper it looks fantastic because grocery is a huge business. So based on the strength of that, uh, or people telling them, of course, we will use online grocery shopping all the time. They built huge refrigerated warehouses. They uh, filled them with food, got a fleet of trucks, and then they launched, and whereas in the market research, most people, let's say, I'm, I don't know the exact number uh, off the top of my head, let's say 60% of people said, yes, if grocery shopping were available, uh, we would use it. When they actually launched it, that number was not even close to it. It was less than 10% uh, of that. So that is an example of not doing uh, pre topic So they built something on a very large scale, where in fact, they could have tested it on a very small uh, scale. A more recent example oh, is, uh, yeah, go ahead. One question for you in regards to WebVan. What about if um, your idea is good, people say they want it, but the timing isn't right? Will pre-prototyping flesh it out, or is that something that could confound it, even if you do this right? Of course, that's a very good question. So, of course, the, the idea has to be the right it at the right time. Uh, WebVan, but if you're trying to build a company that does internet grocery delivery 20 years ago, uh, that, uh, you know, that, and 20 years ago, people are not ready. 
that is still a failure. So one of the goals of crypto tapping is to make sure not only that your idea is right, but the timing is uh, right for it. Uh, by contrast to Webvan, uh, there is a, a, another company called uh, who's, uh, that used to sell cars online. So instead of starting with a big inventory and assuming that people would buy cars online, they created a website that had no cars in their lot. They launched the website and only when people click to, to buy a car, they would actually buy one at retail and sell it at retail. Uh, uh, so losing a few hundred dollars in each process, but they were able to validate on a very small scale that people would actually uh, buy cars online. So it's two very different approaches. Test a little before you invest a lot. Yeah, that's very smart. That makes a lot of sense. It seems, uh, of course, you could say it's obvious in retrospect, but I'm sure most people still don't do it. And uh no matter how good the idea is. Well, the problem, Richard, is that people, and, and by the way, every, every error I talk about, it, I've made it myself. <laughs> so I've been guilty of every single one of these things, falling in love with an idea and launching it, assuming that eventually things will work out. And I think that's the, the big problem, right? People fall in love with the idea and then they get into this mental mode where they ignore all the negative feedback, where they want to convince themselves that the idea is right. So they go down that rabbit hole and, uh, and then get killed at the end. So it's easy to understand logically what I teach. It's much harder to, to, to put it into action. And that's why I felt I should write a book and give you these tools and experiments and tests that you can run literally in a matter of two hours to get data, to make sure that your idea is, uh, is right. But like many things in life, Knowing what to do and what's the right thing is harder than actually putting it into action. Didn't you do the exact same thing with this book? Did you pre-type oh, yes. it in um, some way anyway. test it? Yeah, thank you for asking. Me. Writing a book is very hard to work. So, and as we know, like every other product in the world, most books fail in the market. So what I did is, before I wrote this full, properly published book, I, wrote, I took one week and wrote a prototype book. 72 pages with the basic ideas and concepts uh, of the full book. I just wanted to see, are people interested in it? So I made it available for free. Then people said, well, can you put it on Amazon because I want to read it on my Kindle? So it would cost 99 cents. What has happened is that uh, by now I lost count because once you have the PDF out in the wild, I think probably tens of thousands of people have read it. Not only, but people started to create an authorized translation of my book. So it's been translated, my previous book, booklet, into a dozen languages. So from my point of view, I knew that there is a lot of uh, evidence, data, that people are interested in this subject. And only then did I decide to write the book. And it was also easier to find a publisher because the publisher was presented with data that I could write a book and that people were interested in the topic. Yeah, so I, I practice what I preach as much as possible. That's awesome, that's really cool. I was gonna ask you, what, so what are people, do you do any consulting on this now? And if so, what are businesses and people's reactions to you uh, showing them this concept? Do they resist it? Do they embrace it? Are they afraid of it? No, it's, it's the opposite. So I, I really don't call it consulting. I call it teaching because uh, if you've read the book, the, the early release, uh, you know, once I explain it, you can do it by yourself. There's nothing complicated about it. Uh, the reaction has been, I would say, 99% of the time, extremely positive, probably even 100% of the time. But Maybe some people don't like it, <laughs> just not uh, telling me. You know why? Because whether it's a small company or a Fortune 100 company, everybody has experienced the situation where they, they thought they had a great idea, they spent a lot of money and a lot of time building it, and they launched it, and it failed. And so I sit down with them. Before I show them the technique, I ask them, share with me some of your failure stories. Why did you fail? Is it because you couldn't build it? No, we built it well. Is it because you couldn't market it? No, no, the marketing was good. So eventually they realized, ah, we built a product that the market was not interested in. And then I show them the techniques of how they can look in the future, peek into the future a little bit with crypto tapping techniques to see if people would actually buy. It. Also, uh, uh, by the way, one of the key things, I try to get them to depend on data and not opinions, whether it's theirs or other people. If you think that the product is great, if other people think that the product is great, great, fantastic. But are they willing to put their money behind it? Again, my expression is, are they willing to open their wallet as much as they're willing to open their mouth? 
because the strongest sign of market interest you could get is market dollars. Now, if you can come up and at the end, you pre-totype it and people are actually willing to put, out, put down market dollars, you know that you're on the right track. Now, of course, you could always fail, right? Competitors can do it better or more quickly or, you know, market uh, external events can affect it. But at least you will not have failed because you, you were foolishly uh, in love with your idea and you did not test it. I think this would make a very good workshop for entrepreneurs and business people, a pre-totyping workshop, because, you know, it does sound simple. Yeah, just go test it and all that. But I'm betting people get stuck. They say, all right, well, what should we test? How should we test? And I bet you there's fear in doing it. Um, so I don't know. It's just, I guess, my unasked for advice. I, I think this definitely would make a great workshop. You should test it, by the way. <laughs> but I think people would pay quite a bit to uh, do something like this. No, no. Richard, I've, I've been testing workshop for the past uh, five years. And uh, I do them. Uh, they're very, very popular and they work very well. You know, companies usually oh, send sure. me groups of uh, 10 to 20 people and then they send uh, uh, more people. Yeah, so we definitely have, uh, I mean, we definitely, me, I do everything myself. I've run uh, two-day workshops uh, at companies. I've, uh, I actually taught a full 10-week class at Stanford on the topic of prototyping combined with, uh, with creativity. So yes, there is material for a workshop, but once again, the book gives you the basics. Some people want to take the workshop to go, to go deep, but a lot of people, I believe, and you've, you, you've read the book, the instructions are very simple and uh, I, I like to think persuasive. You read the book and you will know what to do. And then if you want to sign up for the workshop, you know, we, we can figure something out. That's great. Okay. And then uh, last question or so, um, are there any industries where this is harder to do than others? <clears throat> any industries you found where people need um, a much bigger helping hand? Yes, I, I think industry where there is a lot of regulation, you, you already mentioned medical. Another one could be uh, is insurance. You know, I work with companies in, in, in both of those fields. Uh, so, but in those cases, you still need the techniques, right? Because the, the failure rate is still the same. You just uh, need to modify them a little bit. So, for example, if you don't pretend that you have a medicine that cures a disease if you don't already have it, right? But you, you can find other ways of measuring how motivated people are in finding a cure for a particular disease. So uh, I talk quite a bit about ethics in the book, but I cannot think of a single industry or business or situation where the 80-20 uh, rule, by the way, I heard your pod podcast on the 80-20, so I'm going to refer to that, right? Uh, okay. 80% of ideas fail fail, <laughs> right? <laughs> fail in the market. You've got to find that 20% that actually works out. And just as the 80-20 rule applies to pretty much any complex human uh, endeavor, uh, the principle also apply to failure. Most new ideas will fail. You know, no, m most relationships fail, right? You know, you, you, you're lucky if you find, you, you marry on the, after the first date, right? So you need to do a lot of testing. And uh, no matter what industry you're in, some prototyping techniques uh, and prototyping attitude will help you. And I believe if you don't do it, you're being negligent. Yeah, it makes total sense. Well, this is really great. But the, uh, so let's, I, I want to give people resources because, again, you know, we would definitely want people to pick up the book. And I want them to know where they could find out about the workshops, whether it's in the book or, you know, at a website. So where can people go to get in touch and, you know, talk to you about uh, collaboration? Yeah, so if they go on Google and they either type my name, Alberto Savoia. It's like Albert, like Einstein, but with an O at the end, and uh, Savoia, S-A-V-O-I-A. -A. Or else, type prototyping with an E instead of an O. So it's not prototyping, prototyping on Google. And uh, we are the first uh, set of results. So I'm easy to find uh, on the web and uh, YouTube and all of these places. So there are a lot of resources available. But I wrote the book because I get so many requests, including requests for workshops. I have to say no to you know, nine out of 10 of them. And I thought by writing the book, I can give people uh, answers very inexpensively and uh, very quickly. So, uh, and thank you again for having me, Richard. You know, we're, we're, we're aligned. We're both interested in the future. And my focus yeah. is making sure that the people who invest in the future invest in the right idea. A lot of the technology that you discuss, you know, may or may not work out. You know, we have a terrible track record of predicting the future. And I want to help us get a little better at that. That's great, Alberto. 
Well, I appreciate you coming. It's been a good call, and uh, thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, Richard, and uh, thank you to anyone who has listened. Bye-bye. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you.